as the engine was spray painted after it was assembled. Next, we have a thermostat housing uh, an attachment. On the cast iron intakes, you have a cast iron painted completely orange thermostat housing. Typical head parking bolts are TR. Uh, it does have a pot number on it. The reproductions usually do not have a pot number on it. And they have a GM logo in them as well. The fuel injected, we can go over the fuel injected car and stop at the fuel injected company. So this is completely different, as everybody knows, the fuel injection setup. Um, one of the things what you need to look for on the side is you might have to pull here some. So you have on the distributor the drive gear which drives the other fuel pump for the fuel injection here. Again, we have tag, just like the carburetor car, uh, foil, thin metal tag. Uh, on the other side is the fuel injection number. There's a tag over there, with serial number and everything on it. Um, fuel meter ID tag, which is over here. That's pretty much. There's a lot of pieces to this as well. But we can't get into that much detail right now. Um, yeah, basically you're looking at finishes, finishes of, of items, uh, screw finishes, and then whether it, everything is pulled together properly and configured properly. Correct. And now this car would have a cast um, thermostat housing, and that would be a painted silver because the intake manifold is silver. So they wouldn't put an orange um, thermostat housing on a silver intake. And that has a pot number as well. It does not have a GM logo on it. And the intake manifold is completely aluminum. You would do have evidence of orange oil spray down low. Then after the car was after the engine was painted, they did touch up with some silver spray around the edges of the intake. So the head surface is not left natural. And I think that's it on the. Yeah. Yeah. And now you got an accelerator. Here accelerator? Around the side. Huh? So, so accelerator. Can you show us where that tag is? Um, oh, yeah. So here's the tag. It's it's hidden pretty well behind these two tubes. Uh, in 64 and 65, there's only one tube. You can see it a little better. Um, but what we'll do is we'll try to zoom in there um, while we're judging and get the um, the fuel injection number. There was a 375 unit in 63, and then in the 63, 64, 375 R, where they made some changes, and then they went to the 380 unit, which has a few other changes in it. Um, they went to an electric actuator to help with uh, warm starts, cold starts, and did away with the cranking si signal valve. Those are the differences in them. Uh, and also, late in 64, they started putting a uh, bit number. They did. On the, on the thing. So early on, the only way we could tell whether a fuel injection unit really belonged on that uh, particular serial number car was by the uh, the number sequence number of the unit, and then there's a couple of differences with the intake manifolds where the winter's boundary um, mark is. Some are way back in the center of the manifold, and then later on they brought them out. They put them out by the thermostat housing. So that is another way we can tell whether it actually belongs here. Configuration, and then and then a couple of numbers. Uh, on to an accelerator le lever. The first part is the accelerator lever that's on the firewall, and that's the arm that actually comes up out of the firewall and moves back and forth when you step on the, on the pedal. And that arm should be cat plated, and it usually has a stick on the inside. 
I'm going to have a stand for H and H, and then it also has um, a little reinforcing rib in it. Uh, the next section is linkage, brackets, springs, and the ground strap. And this is where I say if um, the ground strap is attached to a, a bare metal item or plated item, um, they don't need the star washer to break through the paint and make a connection. And that actually is seen in the assembly manual uh, drawing. There is no ground strap uh, no. star washer in the uh, assembly manual. Um, some judges look for a star washer, some judges don't. To be honest, whether it has a star washer or, or it doesn't have a star washer, the whole assembly is worth 10 points. So if we break them down, you know, what is the value of a star washer? Um, this, uh, this, uh, you know, yeah, you write a note if you have to. One thing we look at uh, on the uh, accelerator uh, linkage is that the Carter pin is up against the flat part of the little plastic insert and the uh, flat part, the washer part of the plastic uh, insert will uh, protect against the um, against the carter pin. And then in some years, they can use a carter pin, they actually put the return spring through the hole of the lever uh, as the retainer for the lever. So those are the little things you need to know about each particular. Most of this stuff isn't in the book, but the book is a good reference yeah. um, to go by. You should always have it when you're judging. Yeah, it could be all out of the book, and it may just be knowledge that you have. It also could be in the assembly manual. We're on to oil fill system. Two hose and cap. So here's the tube, and on solid engines, the tube is chrome plated. And it has chrome plate cap. That's not the greatest chrome, but it is GM quality right. chrome. Right now, notice the washer on the inside. And one of the things you want to look for is on an original cap uh, where it was bent over a machine tool and it has these stretch knots lined all along them. And the reproductions don't seem to have any that I've seen. So that's one good indication. The other thing with the original cap is the very top of the cap is flat. It's not a perfect dome, it's going to go flat spot on. About three eighths diameter, it comes to a flat one. It's not perfectly round. So when we judge that, it's only one line, 10 points, oil we'll fill two, close the cap. We have to have a discussion, Andy and I, on how much. Um, value we place on the actual tube, how much we place on the hose, and how much we place on the cap. And, you know, the hose is a brown, black rubber hose. We probably would, would break up the tube and the cap um, five points a piece. Yeah. Or if you did five, four, and one, you could do that. Right. And on the hydraulic lifter cars, you just go over here. The tube is painted black and it's a solid rubber hose that goes around the back of the carburetor. That's the difference. Okay, Joe, what about fuel pump? Fuel pump. Obviously, we can't get the camera down to see a fuel pump. I right think on. Andy has a pump that is not uh, bolted onto a car. We have two different fuel pumps, 63 to 64. All 63s use a 4657 pump. And then the higher horsepower 64 cars with a Holly carburetor. I believe it's a 40083. Good. That's the original. And then the bottom has an AC logo as well as the top. A lot of reproductions do not have that. It's, they're both. Uh, will be a three piece. Right. Um, this should have black screws. And then in 64, instead of two screws holding it, it's a metal um, bottom 
with four screws, there's two screws on the outside. So there's an extra boss. You can't tell the dates on these. There are dates. It's deep in this hole. Um, you need a magnifier to see right. it. You cannot see it on the car. So if we have the 4657 uh, um, without any date um, coding on the outside of, of it, we give a benefit of the doubt right. to the owner that the, the uh, fuel pump's dated from. Most of the time it's dirt and on grease, so you can't see it anyways. But what it is, is it would be the year number, 63 or 64, and it would have hash marks around it like a clock, which indicate the month. Next up, engine compartment, lines, fittings, and clamps. Uh, that is the metal feed line that uh, feeds your fuel pump uh, or comes from the fuel pump up to the carburetor. To the fuel filter. Yep, fuel filter. Uh, the fuel filter is uh, judged after, mm -hmm. so it will be the line that runs up to there. Uh, so all lifter cars is typically a chrome plated uh, mild steel, so they would be magnetic, although we don't use magnets anymore to judge the cars. Um, and the uh, base motor cars usually use a uh, plain steel um, fuel line. One of the things in 63 is the fuel clamp on the hose is a tower style clamp. 64 and later is a round clamp style with squared off ends and it's usually green in color. Fuel filter. You don't want to talk about the squared off ends, the shop corner? Well, I just said that. Let me get it. <laughs> this is why we had two judges. <laughs> This is what Joe likes. So he has a 64 and later style plant with the squared off end. I don't know how well you can see it. But it's still screen red. Oh, beautiful. Now, does the plant have enough value that if it had the rounded off safety edges, um, we would take a deduction? We wouldn't take a deduction, but we would write a note to the owner that that is incorrect. Um, we would not say it correct, but we would put a note and tell them that it should be squared off. Um, and remember this, you can always write a note, a message to the owner about a subject and not take a deduction. However, if you do take a deduction for something, you always have to write a reason for taking that deduction. Okay, next we're going to go on to the heat shield. Okay. Okay, the question is, the current judging guide for the 63-64 is a bit out of date, 2012. Any word on the 7th edition guide? Uh, well, that might be coming out. We, we can't, uh, the question is, do we know when the new 63-64 manual is coming out? And, and I, I don't have any news on that right now. We're, we're running through a, a judging school. If you have a question on how, how we're judging or what you would do there, um, you know, we'll try to answer that, but I can't really answer when the new judging manual will be. I mean, these manuals get updated um, when when all the information is in and, and you know, people can contribute to, to getting it done. I do know they're working on it, so hopefully that helps. And then one more. Would the oil fill cap be removed from the engine during flight judging? So the judge should not remove anything. You can ask the owner to remove it. Um, so you can check the, the underside. And he is the owner of this car, so, so it's okay if he removes anything. But typically, we don't remove anything from the car. You, you can ask that if he removes so you can look underneath. Most owners are very happy to do that for you. Yep. We don't want to scratch any cars. We don't want to drop an item. We don't want to break anything. Um, so it's basically a hands-off judging. That's another reason why we don't use magnets any longer. 
Um, our judging standard is appearance. If you read the, the technical judging manual or you read our um, judge's handbook, um, anytime you see the word appearance, it's either bold or italicized. So that's, you know, that's our judging standard is appearance. Okay, on to heat and radio shielding, grounds and brackets. So, uh, radio shielding is 16 pieces of shielding and probably, what is it, 8, 10, 12, is 12. Um, there's 12 brackets that hold everything. There's some grommets, there's uh, plenty of bolts, so it's quite a bit of um, quite a bit of items on there for 10 points. Um, we're looking for how things are installed. Uh, I know on the driver's side, the, the rear vertical piece is mounted outside of, I mean, sorry, the rear horizontal piece is mounted outside of the vertical section. Uh, that's what we look for. Uh, are all the wing nuts there? There's two lower V's down there, those are attached. Um, Another thing is while we're over here on 63 only, on the passenger side, it's a solid one piece, but it has a bar that connects the two of them. And the later cars have two pieces. I don't know if you can see that. But. Also on that piece, there's a reinforcement rib at the center where, where it jumps across the exhaust manifold. There's a little reinforcement on the inside. You should be able to get your hand in there feel for that. Um, the replacements of the reproductions do not uh, do not have that reinforced in them. Okay, can you try to grab the top shield so we can show some of the differences in the top shields? There are there are two different shields in 63. Um, one has uh, slots in the back of it for the carburetor uh, tab. And well, oh, oh, sorry, for the distributor tab, there's a slot for carbureted cars and there's a slot for fuel injected cars. One faces in, one faces out. And on the top, you have metal rivets, and inside, you have like a mylar plastic liner with the rivets and the tabs. One's a single piece tab, the other is a T style tab, a layer. Next. All right, next up is ignition coil, mounting, and capacitor. There's a coil here. Um, you really can't see the, the coil number on it. On some vehicles, you can, depends on which way it's positioned. Um, but you definitely see it don't go ready on the top. And then there's two little square bosses that keep the um, little squares from spinning. Mm -hmm. Early cars um, were all, was it early cars on 087? Was it 087? That that's, was, that's base cars, basically base cars. And then there's an 091. Yep, for this. And one of, one of the things is the original ones all have this stud is uh, metallic. I know you really can't use a med, but you can, you can tell if it was stainless steel stuff. Yeah, the stainless studs have a certain look to them, so. And then there's a screw over the plant. That's a regular head screw. Yep. Flat head screw. Flat head, yep. And then the capacitor on the side. Right. If it had a radio, it has a capacitor. So the radio delete, there's no capacitor. Okay, next is distributor, cap, and vacuum advance. 15 points there, we have to decide what the value of the distributor is, what the value of the cap is, and what the value of the vacuum advance is. So fuel injected distributors, they have a large plate on the side that has the distributor part number, and um, the cast, uh, not casting date, but the assembly date of the distributor. We'll come around and show that. 
So there's a play here on the side of the distributor. Um, that's actually an access plate to do some service in there, but also um, they stamp some items on there. Um, 63 and 64 both have different model number distributors. I'm sure that has to do with the hand change and uh, a weight um, advance um, difference. Yeah, we'll yeah. So the 60, the fuel injected cast, the distributor cap is smaller. It's yeah, short. It's a short time. tower. This tower here is short on fuel injected cars, and then the spot plug wise, which we'll get to later, yeah. uh, have the 90 degree boot to person. Uh, on the distributor caps, it also says Delco Remy. There's no, it's a patent pending cap, there's no R, and then there's a couple of differences to show to be able to tell um, the way the window shape is, and then there's a little uh, tower on the side here where that's molded in that wasn't molded into the, the early reproductions and now is in the later reproduction. So the later reproduction is a pretty good cap for judging. And then vacuum advance, there are also some numbers on the vacuum advance. Same thing, the, the base model cars have a certain vacuum advance, the fuel injected cars have a certain vacuum advance. When they change the camshafts to 64, they also change the vacuum advance. So there are numbers there, should be called out in the uh, manual for which vacuum advance should be on which distributor. Uh, the base model cars, uh, have a aluminum um, uh, part number tab around them that's just clipped on, and those also have uh, assembly date stamped into that also. And the, the part number or the number on the vacuum advance, you can usually see it looking straight down. It's a three-digit number. Okay, spark plugs and wires. So all of the, the wires had a date. Uh, for instance, these are third quarter of 62. So you just have to look at the production of the vehicle and make sure yeah. that they. This is a February car, so uh, late 62 is a good date. Um, and, and so we're all about it through the shielding. Like we said, there's a 90 degree of fuel injection. They're straight up if it's a, a carbureted car. Um, you can't. It's very tough to see the spark plugs, but um, with, with a light and hopefully a couple of spark plugs oriented uh, in a certain manner, you can tell they should be ACs. Um, most of them are 44. Green writing, AC 44, no R. We do look for resistor plugs. We try to see if we can um, see the rings and the later AC deltos say AC Delta on them, they don't just say AC. And it's a smaller font. Yeah, it has an italic, smaller italic font. Um, that's 10 points. We typically will go five points for spot plugs, five points for wires. That gives you, um, using the 20% for each CDCIF, basically it's an easy shot of one point if it's um, configuration, one point if it's date. The next is the tap drive cable, which you can really see really well on this car. And that's an original gray in color tap drive cable. Uh, 63, they were typically all gray, early 64 gray, and then they transitioned to black. Right. And you might see some that have a very light gray. Some of them, the gray uh, yellows a bit. But the other thing you know, in 63, the gray sheathing actually goes over the metal end, and then it's crimped with a little um, a little pin crimp. And then in 64, when they go to the black cable, the now the end fitting is over the cable, and they use a hex crimp to crimp. Sure. All of that, and we have two points to work with. So if something major, major has to be wrong with that um, tack cable in order for it to be a deduction. And last is transistor ignition, harness, and amplifier. Um, there, were re there was no transistor ignition in 63, and there were very few built in 64. Um, you know, typically, it's just a three-point uh, give because most of these cars just have points. Correct. 
Okay, let's end the page two on the page three. Any questions? No questions, huh? Okay. No questions. No. Anybody? This no. is gonna be boring no. if we don't have questions to answer. Okay. Some of that stuff oh, yeah. might be better seen. Okay, you are careful. You really can't get so it. one thing to remember now exhaust manifolds. We may have looked at the paint on the exhaust manifold during entry painting, but uh, we off we want to remember make sure there's some orange traces of orange is probably a lot of it burned off but under the orange they should be natural cast iron we look for any kind of coating some people like to work coating on there to protect them from rusting uh, we do look for coating when we judge the manifolds and that's all we're judging is the manifolds um, can we go to the other car so i wanted to show a couple of items details so on the exhaust manifolds, original manifolds have a parting line across the top of the manifold, right down the center of the manifold. And then very tough to see here, but there are little uh, raised portions. So they are about three quarters of an inch long, maybe three sixteen wide. One, two, three of them on the back side. One, two, three, sometimes four on the front side. And those should be obvious. The later model replacement GM and some of the reproductions, that casting line is just ground off all the way across. So they had such a big amount of flashing when they cast them, they just ground it right across. So you won't see that on an original manifold. And he's got another manifold here, he's got some more. Oh yeah, those are way more pronounced there. You can really see them. The casting line, one, two, three, four at the rear, and one, two, three at the front. And then if they all have a pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they all have a pattern. We'll read um, obviously two inch will have a different pot number than the um, two and a half. And believe it or not, the fuel injected manifold has the same part number. It's just whether or not it has a hole drilled in it for the. Um, All carburetor cars have a choke tube coming out. I'll go back to the car. A choke tube. And on the fuel injected cars, it's all in left, but what you just saw. So, next line is bolts. So here we have five points. Five point people, bolts, studs, nuts, flanges, locks, washers, and heat, and heat riser. So we give 15 points to the manifolds and then five points to the rest of all the stuff here. Um, here's a heat riser. Uh, fuel injected cars do not have the flap in them. They're wide open. It's just a spacer. This is just a carburetor car. Basically, it keeps the heat up in uh, the carburetor until the engine's fully warmed, and then as it warms up, the heat riser, this little spring opens the heat riser. This is actually upside down, but that's okay. It will flop down. Yeah, that looks better. And that just spaces outward or inward? That is um, towards the starter motor. Okay. Uh, bolts, we look at the bolts that hold the exhaust manifold to the car. One thing to remember about exhaust manifolds is there's no gaskets. They're just manifold up against the head. So that's why in this line, there's no spot for gasket. But in the top, if we have the manifolds um, with gaskets, we might make a comment in there and take an appropriate point. Um, so bolts typically uh, are a uh, 916 head with just a circle. There may be a circle on the head with a letter inside, but typically they all just have a circle. The studs are the studs that go down out of the manifold and attach the exhaust pipe to the exhaust manifold. So those studs have a certain length. They shouldn't be extra long. They shouldn't be too short. Um, and they definitely are not stainless. They're just um, regular carbon steel. The nuts have a funny shape to them. They are a self-locking nut. They're not a long grass nut. There should not be any um, any lock washes on them. Um, and I guess if you saw our original nut, you would understand what they look like. But um, 
I usually draw a photo of a person that doesn't have um, the proper nuts. I draw a little configuration drawing for them on what the nuts should look like. Um, flanges are the piece that holds the pipe to, to the exhaust manifold. Um, those flanges should be a thick uh, metal stamping. They're not a thin uh, stamping with a flange. It's just a, a big flat plate. The locks are the French locks. Um, French locks should be bare steel. They shouldn't be um, stainless. They should be regular carbon steel. Um, they should have one tab bent over. Whichever tab is on the flat side of the attaching bolt, that's the tab that the French lock gets bent over. Uh, behind the French lock is a flat washer, a very thick flat washer. It looks like a lock washer, but it's, um, it has no slit in it. And then the heat riser, Andy showed us the heat riser. So you need to decide how to um, allocate your five points to those 25 or 30 items we just discussed. So it's really hard to take take a whole point for some. For so I guess at this point, what we have, what do we have? Uh, six bolts, six bolts, six studs, uh, nuts. six nuts, um, four flanges, two flanges, two, two, two flanges, four four French locks, um, one heat riser, one heat riser, and eight washers, um, all with five points. I guess everybody can kind of deduce from this one line item that NCRS has really decided what are the very important items they want us to look at and judge. A fuel injection unit is 40 points, an engine block, casting numbers 350 points, and then all this little stuff here, 30, 40 items, five points. Um, I think as NCRS enthusiasts and members, we're caught up on the nuts and bolts and head markings and things like that. But on the judging field, it doesn't carry a lot of weight. Um, so we have to pay attention to that when we're actually doing the judging. If somebody has a, a couple of incorrect bolts or a couple of incorrect washers, we don't want to be taking a full point off for something. We will write a note and let them fix it at a later date and um, take it from that point. And, and the thing about that, uh, taking a point, some people have an opinion, and I'll put this out here now, some people have an opinion. If I don't take a point, the person will not fix it, ever fix it. And that's why I take a point, even though it doesn't have a lot of value. Um, I always put it this way, when I'm when I'm teaching at the judging training retreat, retreat, and this question comes up, is I always tell people we are not the police to tell people, force people to change something on their car. They may never want to change it. We're just there on this day to judge the car as it's presented on the judging field. So the other thing you have to remember is with flight judging, we're not bow tie judging. A lot of people get hung up on the bow tie judging if it doesn't have to be from a knot or this or that, they take a punch for it. But this is flight judging. So reproduction parts are allowed and um, depending on the quality, if you accept them, you know, that's one thing. It's not a bow tie judge. So we do have a question. Somebody asked what a French lock is. So I don't know if Andy has a sample of a French lock, but in between the bolt that holds the exhaust manifold to the engine, it's a little um, U-shaped piece with two holes in it that the bolts go through. And where the bolt goes through, there's a, two little tabs. So as you tighten the bolt up, you have two little tabs sticking out. And to help hold the bolt from loosening up, backing out, you actually bend the tab over against the nut, the flat portion of the nut. So we also made a, a slide presentation, PowerPoint, of this that we'll do at a later date and they'll answer some of these questions. Uh, we did it just in case this didn't work out, we could always put that. But we do have a lot of detailed pictures that show these French locks, bolts, all the special head markings, all that stuff. 
And remember, on the French locks, this is another question that came up. There are two tabs on the French lock, and that all that does is you only bend one tab over. You find the tab that's closest to a flat portion of the bolt, and you'll notice they're, they're positioned perfectly so that if one is on a flat portion, the second one is definitely on the point, pointy side of the bolt. All right, moving on to AIR system. Um, there are no AIR systems in 63 and 64, so for this particular judging, we would just give full credit for that. Dipstick. Yep, engine oil. Three parts to this section 12 dipstick, dipstick tubes, pressure line assembly. So, George, the dipstick is on your side. The dipstick's on my side, but your nickname is dipstick, so you should probably talk about the dipstick. So, on 63, 64, it's all about their engines. The dipstick is chrome. Did I touch you? You, you can touch my dipstick. Okay, I'm going to pour it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have an oil rag, Joe. Look at that oil rag. So, here's a couple of things we could talk about. So, um, solid electric cars with uh, aluminum valve covers have a chrome handle. Uh, the differences between 63 and 64 is uh, 63 has this little flat cap with a fiber. Um, wash that fiber, it's more felt, felt washer on them. Um, somewhere along we'll have a, a W stamped in it. And then if you notice where it says add full and then engine oil, it's embossed on one side, embossed on one side, debossed on the other side. So it gets punched right through. This is a hydraulic mixer dipstick. It's painted black and it has a rubber, not a felt. So 64 is a rubber cap, 63 is a metal cap. And the whole tool is painted black. On, the, on that car, it's on the fuel injected, 63, it's unpainted. The pressure line runs from the back of the engine into um, the, the oil pressure gauge, and that is a copper coated metal piece. It is not a brass uh, tube, which a lot of the uh, replacements are a brass tube. So it's copper coated metal, and also it is actually bent um, by a uh, uh, a bender, it's not just thrown in there, it's, it actually has specific bends in it to go from the engine into the car. You have a question. Yeah. Okay, water pumping system. Water pump and fittings. Okay. So again, on your solid lifter engines, your water pump has a thread hole on the top and a bypass holes that attaches to the intake manifold, and that is typically painted. On the hydraulic engines, this is solid. There is no bypass holes. Right. Two different pumps, two different part numbers. You can't see the part number when you're judging. It's hitting the soft behind the pulley. Yeah. Um, somebody didn't ask a question, but they made a statement that early 64 cars have the same, very early 64 cars have the same dipstick as 63 cars. So that could happen. You know, there's a lot of interchanges. They didn't um, just throw parts away. Obviously, they used them until they ran out. And there were also running changes along, along the way, too. One thing we didn't talk about was very early um, high horsepower and fuel injected 63s. They didn't have all the chrome parts ready, so they just put black painted parts on on cars that they wanted to have all the dress-up items on. Um, these are things you need to learn during your judging time um, when, when different changes happen. Um, anything else about water pumps? We can't read the number. It's behind the pulley. Um, there 
are not any lock washers holding the water pump to the engine. Um, and you'll find that on most of the hardware that holds items onto the engine block, there are no washers. Um, there's just the bolt right up against um, whatever the part is. Uh, radiator hoses and clamps. Uh, all the radiator hoses should be held on with these towel style um, clamps and then the heater hoses have two different style clamps, a Corbett clamp and the other style. Typical radiator hose has a part number and the, the loop strike. It's the upper radiator hose. Upper radiator hose. No loop strike. Radio hose lower. No loop strike. On the lower radiator hose, radiator hose, there is a part number as well in the GM mode. Yeah, all of the lower radiator hoses were the 170 because the water pump and the radiator are in the same place on every car. Um, the upper hoses, there are several different upper hoses, whether it's an air conditioned car, whether it's a high horse versus the low horse because of the shape of the intake manifold and the way the hose comes out of the um, thermostat housing. Um, we do look, um, on the hoses to make sure the some of the reproduction hoses um, might have somebody else's insignia somewhere on them and they don't take that off. Some of them actually have an embossment in them that say made in Mexico with stuff like that. And it has a, it has a rib to it, a texture, and you, you can see. So another question was whether the bolts on the water pump are painted. Um, so the water pump was on the engine when it was painted, so the bolts should be painted. There are some items like the, um, the solid lifter cars have an idle pulley. They take a bolt out, they replace it with a long stud to be able to adjust the idle pulley. That stud is not painted. Um, the bolt that holds the um, alternator bracket on, you may see some of the... Um, paint worn off from having to take that off and put it back on to put the bracket on because that alternator was installed after the engine was painted and actually after it left the engine um, assembly plant. Um, so a question is what's the significance of the blue line on the radiator hose? Um, anytime you see a rubber item, um, there'll be some sort of telltale of who actually made the, the part. Um, the heater hoses have the GM logo on them that may have been specified by GM. Um, there's some that have lines cut in them. Um, sometimes on the rubber items, if you look at the end, there's actually colored string impregnated inside of the rubber item. Uh, that's a manufacturer mark. So probably for uh, warranty purposes, and I'm speculating here, for warranty purposes, if they happen to have a whole bunch of failures, they can look at the holes, they can find out what manufacturer made it, they can go back and correct where the problem is. I would imagine that blue stripe is basically a, a manufacturer's um, uh, like identification. Um, it also could be a blue stripe, but although they would have a different color stripe for a 300 horse versus a fuel injected car so that a person on the assembly line could identify an item. But since they all have blue stripes, I'm imagining that's the manufacturer's, uh, a manufacturer's mark. Also, the bypass holes and clamps look like they're fully painted orange. Is partial overspray typical as well, or should they be fully painted? Okay, so the question Different is levels. whether they're fully painted. Um, it depends on the person that was painted, painting on that day and how thorough a job they did. Um, it is painted all the way up to the intake manifold because if you look at the shape of the, the engine, they need to get paint all the way to the intake manifold and the whole uh, water pump is painted. So you could have um, a lot of paint on it and you, and you could have a little bit of paint on it, but there's definitely paint on it. Um, in my 
if I was going to to paint an engine, the, that bypass hose would be fully coated with paint because it was a giant gun spraying a large pattern and and they were very crude when they painted. They painted the whole exhaust manifold. They knew it would burn off, but they painted the whole exhaust manifold. So everything was painted up to the intake manifold. So I guess it's just varying amounts of coverage, but um, I guess if there's paint on that, then you know we're gonna we're gonna get credit for that. Okay, next we're on to uh, yeah, well, Alex, sir. No, he he was, was, he's always in class. Tom, any chance you can come over here? Again, the hoses, they have a GM logo. They're routed a certain way. And on 63, they have these metal bands that hold them together. Uh, they're silver, you know, unfinished aluminum. And then the clamps are these Corbin type clamps that squeeze and hold them together. You, you shouldn't see uh, a later style radiator hose clamp on there. Um, also, up against where they're installed is a felt uh, grommet going into the heater core. Only 63. Only 63. The others are behind. The later ones are behind. And then you have a key fitting, which you really can't see. And 60, on 64 cars, it's a band type clamp. We can show you that. Another thing on the heater hose is there is a specific routing. The lower hose, which is the 5 8 hose, comes up and over the T, and the T actually holds that hose up away from the exhaust manifold and the, um, the battery. So you can see how this hose comes up and actually goes over the T, and then through this clamp that is attached to um, the alternator brace. And then on the 64, you can see the foam is behind the heater box. Rather than up front. One hose has a in the square, the other hose has these ribs in it. And the one that has a GM in the square should not have any ribs. Most of them still have the ribs on, but that one should not have any ribs. There is a photo in the assembly manual of how that um, heater hose is routed. And I think we put a copy of that in the, um, in the 63 form manual. Okay. Next we on to the balancer and the bullets. Crankshaft, water pump, and idler assembly. So the, the balancer and pulleys, four points total. Right. On the, the high horse engines, the, the pulley, or the balancer is an eight inch pulley. And if you look from underneath, you can see the inside of it has fins. Uh, it's, if you don't have the fins in there, then you know it's a reproduction balance. And on the 300 horse, 250 horse, the balancer is significantly smaller. Yeah, it's thinner. No question. Um, question is, is 63 heater hose different than 64 yeah. heater hose? I don't believe any of the heater hoses are different from 63 right yeah. up to 67. Yeah. Um, no. One with a GM square, the other one with the four, three or four lines in it. Um, and if you look in the assembly manuals for 63 and 64, I'm pretty sure the routing is the same also. It is the routing. The only difference that I've seen in some of these hoses, you have the GM writing in, in white, yellow, or red. And I don't okay. know what the significance of that is. Okay, back to we'll okay, back to the balancer and the police. Um, all of the cars have a stamped steel uh, lower pulley, and then there may be some differences in the width. I know the high performance cars have a deep groove pulley versus a small group pulley. They actually look the same. It's just the width of the area where the um, 
where the belt goes in. It's the same belt. It just sits deeper in the deep groove than it does in the, in the regular groove. Um, and then the high, higher horsepower cars, do all the cars have a, how do you put them on them? Only the high no, horsepower no. cars have an idler. There's, a, there's an idler pulley bolted to the bottom of the bar that holds the second, um, the second belt in place. Right. And while we're on, we're on belts. The belts have a part number on them. They have a part number in Boston. Yeah. And See, they're, cloth, they're a cloth wrapped belt, they're not a cut belt. Right. Well, you can see the difference, they're not complete wrong. On to alternator. Okay. Let me get the alternator. So, in the first section, we're going to um, judge the alternator. So, there are a couple different configuration issues. We need to look at um, depending upon options. The rear case of the alternator could be rotated 90 degrees differently. In 63, we have a part number and date that's stamped at the base of the alternator. Um, this one actually has bolts, just so we can show you. There's the. It's very hard to read there, but there's a part number in there. And the date is typically above it, right here. And th this style was usually used up until. January, I think the end of January is the last. And so they could be all the way up into February, March cars. Um, later cars had the part number up here. And all of 64. And they all say 37 amp on them. Um, the air conditioned cars in 64 may have had a different alternator with a little bit more amperage. Um, 12 volt negative, the part number, and then another date. Right. The other thing you want to note is on 63, there is no hole for to hold the harness. To hold the wire harness. They're all rectangle slots. And then we also look for dated diodes right. and a GM capacitor um, in the rear. All right. Pulling in fans. So there's a couple different pulleys. Um, some have uh, we can pin to that one. Some have a spaced out. You can see this one has a smaller space on it, and it's a smaller diameter. Where the um, deep groove will have a larger space because the uh, pulley is actually spaced out farther. 63 is a plated fan. And 64 is a painted fan. Both the fans are separate from the pulley. Another thing about 63 fans, every one of the little fan blades is the same shape all around the 63 fan. And 64, it, and actually, Andy, if you show that fan again, that has the different size. It does. Um, it has one that's longer. It has, yeah, one, one or two that are wider. Than the rest of the right. than the rest of the blades that had to do with the harmonic noise. Tom, can we go over to the 63? Mm -hmm. We all okay. So again, we have we have the part number on the flat part. This is a February car, so it's a January May alternator. Three A twenty eight is the date. Here's our pulley and our fan. Every single fin is the same. It has a large pulley. And there's no hole in the back for the wiring harness. And in 63, they had a lock washer. And then when did they change to 65? Around 65. So all 63 to 4 should have a split lock washer. <laughs> and that washer, the other flat washer, is a little thicker. Uh, flat washer than uh, what you would see anywhere else on the car. So typically on the back of the bracket is a V that you can see. I don't know if you can see it yet, but yeah. it's top of the line. Yeah. But there's a V stamped into the alternate bracket. And the same thing with the attaching bolts, you can have different head markings. A WV is a very common, um, A is very common, M is a very common, uh, another um, um, 
that's a it's a grade two bolt. So another grade two bolt is like RSC. We see a lot RBW and RSC. There's so many different head markings on these cars, um, and and any car could have any head marking. Um, sometimes you see something bolted on with four to six bolts, and it'll have four different head markings. They they just reached in the bin, grabbed four bolts, and, and bolted the piece on. So next up is batteries and cables. Batteries is a standard deduct item, so we have to make sure we we um, double check our um, judging reference manual for standard deducts, or if you guys have a sheet for standard deducts, that gets updated quite a bit. Um, we no longer take capped off. We don't want to spill any battery acid onto somebody's car. Um, so they judged as is. Um, all these cars had an um, tar top battery. Um, there were two different uh, cap models. There's that yellow with the black lettering, and there's also a black. Does the black have a red lettering? On yellow it? So black with the yellow lettering. Um, there is a date code stamped actually in there. It's more heat stamped. Yes, to the top. Um, you can see it. Again, we can we can show that in the slide presentation. If it looks like tar, it's tar. Yes. Um, we don't stick our pencil into the tar to see how soft it is. We don't stick our fingernails in it. We don't stick our pencil in to see how deep it goes to see if we hit something under it. Um, we go back to the word appearance. So if it appears correct, it is correct. Okay, uh, standard deducts, uh, that regular, a uh, real Tartar original style battery is full credit. I believe it's seven points if it is a plastic top Tartar battery and it's a 12 point it's deduct if it's a regular AC Delco modern battery. Okay, then we have battery cables, belt washer, and clips. So the cables are a spring ring style, and the original cables have a rounded um, edge to the to the clamp section that um, holds the battery. The actual um, lead section that holds the the um, cable to the post the post of the battery. Um, the positive cable has a little clip that holds it to the uh, battery uh, holdout. Um, early 63s, the clip was screwed on to the uh, cover and it uh, was bendable. And then the, later on, they went to the same plastic clamp they used to hold the rest of the wiring harness. And that's plugged into a hole at the base of the uh, the positive cable is typically black and it does have a P in the, the spring ring that goes to the side of the battery and the negative is typically a dark brown color. Okay. Uh, and the felt washer is under the positive terminal and typically has a little red oil on it. Mm -hmm. uh, tray pull down, shield, and retain hardware. So the tray is painted black, bolted to the frame, um, four washer head um, machine bolts. Um, the hold down goes around the perimeter of the battery. That's also painted black. Um, in most 63 fours, the back retainer is a um, long stud that is threaded at the bottom, threaded at the top, and the wing nut screws onto that. And then the one that's closest to the engine is a J nut that hooks into the battery base. Uh, battery hold out. And, and then the other side is spread. Yeah. I, I, I can see you in the garage. So here's the J style. Yeah. This is in towards the engine, closer to the engine. And this is outward, closer to the fender. 
And then you, you have these wing nuts that hold it down. Pretty much like the wing nut out of the Aquina. Uh. And typically there's a heat shield on the outside of, of the hold down. Yeah, I uh, Okay, next up, engine compartment is backup light wiring harnesses, including all blocks. No, uh, so that's all this wiring that runs across the back, down the sides to the voltage regulator and horn relay, and then the side is a wiring harness that runs to the front uh, to the front lights. Uh, it should be a little dot on the top of the screen. Uh, very early 63s, there were no backup lights, so we wouldn't see a backup light wire even coming out of the harness. Uh, very, very late in 63, you would get right back up. and forth, so we would see a, a backup light harness coming up here, and then the harness running down the firewall through another clip at the bottom of the firewall into the transmission. And one thing about these clips, the 63s, and early 64s are a clear colored clip. They obviously yellow over time and they are soft and pliable. They're not a hard plastic. Um, there's four of them across. Um, sometimes if you have air conditioning or other options, they might put five or six. Um, there's typically two on this side, two on that side. And then in strategic spots to hold them, um, those clips hold all the wiring to the hood release cable. The hood release cable runs through the metal clips, except at the very end, the wiring harness that runs across is tucked in that metal clip in the corner. And then if you had backup lights, you would have, this clip would actually grab the backup light harness, sometimes the harness and the connector and it holds that harness is we look for those, we make sure they're soft and pliable. Same thing with the ones that run along the fender well. There's three on that side. And one difference in 63, the wiring runs early, the wiring runs under um, the hood stand. The, can we make... No, oh, I'm sorry, I thought we had a question. Um, so anyways, the early in 63, you see the wiring runner running under the hood support, the hood stand, and then later in 63, they run it across the top and then down. And down and around. So we'll show you that in the 64. And, and what I always tell people, the way you tell which way your wiring was run, the holes are there in a specific spot. Um, if it was supposed to run across the top, it had holes in a different spot. If it was supposed to run along the bottom, it has holes in another spot. Okay. It's called out in the in the judging manual approximately when that happened. Um, and you may see a car that's drilled both ways, and that's probably in, in that portion where they were making the transition in one guy ran it one way and another guy ran it the other way. Uh, anything else we look for wiring? Oh, we always we want to check the wiring to make sure there's no repairs in it. There's no extra tape. This tape is uh, non-sticky wrap and it's tied at the end. So if you see any uh, modern electrical tape that's that's sticky, um, where there might be a repair, that obviously um, would be a note in, in the deduction. Uh, next up. Clips and retainers, we talked about uh, voltage regulator and capacitor. So voltage regulators all were double Remy. They say double Remy in the top. And then on the, the bottom there is um, a pot number, a bunch of ones. Um, 63 is a 512, 64 is a 515. And then you'll have 12 volts, and then the date. This one's 4J, so it's probably a top 65 piece. Um, but they'll run anywhere from a 2 yep. up to a, up to a 7 or 67. They have to see in the car, so you typically have to move in there. There's also a capacitor that is bolted on here. If you notice, if the capacitor is oriented a certain way, you may not see the date. Um, but we try to see the date on all of them. But in some, it, it just may be too hard. Uh, 
Juan Rewe is a um, eight, eight thirty four. But the Juan Rewe is pretty easy to see here. It's got a CAD plated cap, and then the uh, wiring harness screwed into it, and then obviously the horn button um, activates it in the back side. Um, it does have a clear plastic um, little separator here to, to uh, isolate the. Um, the Could be the eight twenty four. Yeah, eight twenty four is, is another. And you can see here this one the the, wiring um, the harness and the uh, overflow hose go up and around the principal. Next round to the ballast resistor, which you can get a good shot of it right here. So. Typically, they're white porcelain. They have a metal band going around them, and they usually held on with the stake on, they held on with flathead round screws. Uh, round head flat, which uses a flathead screwdriver. There's a little double Remy um, insignia on the tab. The tab is typically rounded with a little um, a little square section on the end where it can actually the metal is broken off. Where do you go? Right. One, one to the other. Uh, Phillips head with a star washer. And then there's two different um, there's two different balance resistors. One has a uh, blue stripe on it, and one has a black dot on it, and that is dependent upon what is in the car for coil. So here's the balance resistor. That's the rounded edge I was telling you about, and the flat will tear off. And then you can't see it, but you can have a little double ring. Logo. Little logo. See it in the seal. Okay. And this one should have a black dot on it, but I don't see a black dot. There's a black dot. Mm -hmm. There's a black dot. Okay. Last page, page four. Okay. Heating and air conditioning. We don't have an air conditioning car here, so we'll we'll say a little bit about the air conditioning. We just can't show you an example. Our first section is heater box, fan, motor, or block off plate. Uh, so what we'll say about that is that is judged on every car. Right. And the, some of the things you want to look for is it's a natural fiberglass. Uh, so you should be able to see the fiberglass strand on it. And and then the sealant typically when it's installed, sealant around it. So we look for that sealant because every car has that sealant on it. So if you don't see evidence of that. The, I know that the uh, driving manuals say there could be evidence of sealant, but we typically see the sealant on every car. Uh, we only have four points to work with, so if we have sealant or it doesn't have sealant, we're not going to take a deduction for it. We might put a note, could have sealant, should have sealant. Um, the 63 heater fan motor is different than the 64. The 63 was a, a pretty good sized round cylinder, but it was completely coated with undercoating. In 64, it was just painted black. With a pot with a yellow pot and a stamp in it, which you can't see. If you have an FM radio, you have a capacitor. Uh, capacitor. If you have an AM radio, you don't have a capacitor on the heater. Um, you still have capacitors with AM radios, but you just don't have a capacitor on the, on the heater fan. Uh, obviously, if you add heat delete, you would just have a block off plate on there. Um, all of them seem to be held on with the black um, pal nuts. Um, I have seen some with natural looking pal nuts, but are they natural because the black wore off and they're old? Um, judging manual says it should be black. Now in air conditioned cars, we also judge the compressor. The 63 compressor is different than the 64 compressor. They have different labels. They have a metal, um, a metal label actually almost tack welded or, or brazed onto them. Um, there's a different uh, mount and bracket for 63 um, air conditioner compressors. Um, they changed it completely in 64 and that ran through the 67. 
the evaporators are pretty much the same, 63, 64, the shape of the tube that comes out, they have the same valves on them. Um, there's a heater shutoff valve, there's a um, STV valve, right, 63, 64 is an STV valve, and then an expansion valve. Um, all of the hoses typically have a manufacturer label, they also have a date on them for AC, and then the clamps are the regular worm style clamps, they're not they're not quick ends like modern AC hoses. They actually have push on bar fittings with a regular clamp on. Uh, dehydrator and condenser would be mounted in front of the core support, and the early 63 and 64 condensers were a specific shape with squared off ends and a couple of square blocks on the tubing. But like I said, we don't have examples to show you. Um, so we would just give full points for So all those, so we would judge the heater box on a regular heater power, we judge the heater box and fan, and then everything else that has to do with air conditioning, we just get full credit. Okay, so next we're on to the wiper, motor, the washer pump, the hoses, clamps, the reservoir, and the brackets. So the wiper motor is behind here. And you can see the part number with the mirror. Sometimes you can see it without it. And then there's usually a large number stamped on the housing. Um, it's usually like 14, 15, or 16. So, so the housing typically. It's hard to see behind all this wire, yeah, but. Typically in 63 4, we see the 14 um, casting. Mm -hmm. And then the motor is 518. 518. Um, in 65, they went to a 602. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the differences are. They all look exactly the same. They don't all work exactly the same from one car to the other. Um, but for some reason, they made a little change, internal change, and it, it changed the, the power arms. Right. One of the things on the washer pump on 63 and early 64 is, is the washer pump has a different diaphragm uh, clamp on it. It's, it's a clear plastic. It's a one-piece clear plastic. And all of the mechanism is just in that one plastic cap. Mm -hmm. So I'll come around and show that to you. Um, and it's clear, it's, it's a yellow clear, but it's a clear cap. And so in here, the one big O ring and then the three little valves are all pressed into a one piece. When you get to 64, later in 64, it becomes a two piece item. Um, obviously, a lot of screws, it's a little wider. And the, and the back piece holds the three little valves, and then the front has four. Okay, Joe, we got the washer. We got the washer pump. So hoses and clips. Hoses are basically a, a, a round black hose with a couple of ribs on them. Um, one goes out to that washer. One goes out to this washer, and then and then it comes around up and over and onto the. Um, Reservoir, and if I can't get it, that's okay. Obviously, we're doing this for demonstration, and you would have taken the washer bottle off of somebody's car. Joe needs his car, so we're going to take it. But uh, I'm restoring one right now, so I can take this piece. And if, if you notice, the 63 cap is more brownish uh, than black. And it's flat on the top. Regular flat cap with just a hole in it. Mm -hmm. um, we should see blue washer fluid. I wouldn't take a deduction if it was uh, yellow or another color, but we should see. Um, should it be straight water, it should have a washer fluid in it. Mm -hmm. And there's not too much other than a hose going to it in a plastic bottle. And then the last item is the overall cleanliness, which is condition. And it's worth 20 points. Typically, unless the couch is filthy, you know, you don't take off more than one point. Um, well, we don't anyway. But I mean, sometimes we have some couch in that are no one, yeah. no one clean them at all. Uh, if you have a car with a lot of road dirt and whatever, and they haven't really got a lot of it cleaned off, we'll say something off. The car is extra dusty. It might 
take a few points, but you know, typically it'd have to be pretty bad to get a 20 point deduction. That's a little bit of a question. So, okay, we have a couple questions here, Joe. All right, so we're, we're at the end of the judging sheets, but we have some questions. And then obviously, the judges have to sign their names. Um, some people just put initials. I'd like to put, write my name out so if an owner has a question later on, they can contact me and ask me the question. What do we have for questions? On the alternator, is there any ink stamping? Typically not just on the diodes. There could be an ink stamping. Um, uh, I would say if there's a stamping, okay. If there's no stamping, I wouldn't um, you know, take a deduction. Definitely the diodes are stamped with a part number and date code. Um, but I, I've seen restorers put stampings on alternators. I haven't seen enough original cars with a stamping on it for me to say for sure that yes, they all had uh, stampings on them. The next question was, could the blue line on the radiator hose be an indication if it was if it was twisted during installation? We don't know the answer. Could it tell you? Yeah. 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 Any more questions? Yeah, we just got one. Have you noticed variability since you three on the radiator hose lines? Oh. Uh, next question is about hose lines on. The 63 upper radiator holes. Um, they may vary within an inch or two, but typically they, I haven't had a problem with any of them fitting. Any other questions, Emily? No, that's it. Okay, well, that concludes our presentation. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, we had Emily on the computer answering the questions, and Tom behind the camera, Joe Scafidi, and myself. And uh, hopefully, everyone enjoyed what we did today. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for watching. Yeah. Any other questions? Nope. Uh, they the same. Good job. Okay. Would you know?